Good morning. All right, if y'all would please stand, shake off, go shake a hand, come back, finish up us singing this song. you join me in prayer father what a blessing it is to be in your house today just surrounded by other believers by our church family those that we love father and just pray that you'll be with us as we worship you 
pray that you'll just open our hearts for the word that we hear today. Father, that we may live that word. That, Father, when we leave here, what we do brings glory to your kingdom. We lift up those that are sick, those that are hurting, Father, going through struggles that we may be aware of, may not be aware of, Father, but we know that you're in charge and that you can, you can heal them, Father, in your way and just pray that your will be done in each one of those situations. We do pray for this church. Pray that we're a light in our community, Father. Pray that we'll continue to do things such as the extravaganza yesterday where we try to reach the community and let them know about you. Father, we thank you for the many blessings we have for the musicians in our church, the young people that are willing to serve, the many things that you do, dear Lord, that we see you working in the hearts of people. Just pray that you'll be with Brother Rich as he brings our word this morning. We'll hide it in our hearts, Father, and just live it out every day. Ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
hopes he never fails me And all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God You have been faithful And all my life You have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God And I love your voice you have led me through the fire And in darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God your goodness is running out, is running out to me. Your goodness is running out, is running out to me. When my life lay down, I'm surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running out, is running out to me. Your goodness is running out, is running out to me. Your goodness is running out, is running out to me. When my life lay down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running out, is running out to me. And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. God. Dear Lord, we thank you for bringing us all here together, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness and for your goodness, Lord. We love you every day, and we just thank you every day, God. Um, we pray for Brother Rich as, that you just hide him behind the cross as he brings your word, God. We pray for everybody in this church right now and everybody outside of this church, Lord, that they just find you in some way, shape, or form, Lord. In your name I pray, man. Amen. Good morning. Hope everybody is doing well. Hope you've had a great weekend. We'll talk a little bit later about all the, all the wonderful time we had yesterday uh, out at the ball fields in the park and uh, having a great time with the extravaganza. we got a whole segment dedicated to that later on. Uh, so we're going to jump right into God's Word together right now, and that is to start a new sermon series. It's a short one. We just came off of 10 weeks of the first 10. And the first 10, of course, were the Ten Commandments. And those were the commandments that God first gave to his people after he had brought them out of slavery in Egypt. And as he brought them into, as he was about to bring them into the promised land, he was setting up how they were to live in a way that would honor him, that would protect one another, and that would show his image and his reputation and his name to all the people around them, to make them different. 
And so those were the first ten. And he gave us those ten commandments. Don't worry, we're not going to recap them again this week. I know some of you got a little uptight, uh, you know, when you started seeing those lists pop out. This year, this year, this month, what is it, March? The rest of this month, uh, working our way up towards Easter, we've got just two weeks of this sermon series called The Greatest Two. Now here's the thing. Throughout the first ten, we looked at what does the Old, Old Testament commandment say? What does it actually say? And how does the New Testament treat and complete that commandment that was first given to us in the Old Testament? If you notice, most of the time in those ten commandments, Jesus himself spoke specifically to those commandments. He would say things like, you've heard it said, and then he would quote one of the commandments, and then he would give a teaching that would complete that idea, that would complete the commandment and complete our, more our understanding of what that commandment's about. And it's so important when Jesus speaks about it that we make sure we pay attention. Some of those you might recognize, though, were not necessarily red letters in our Bible. They came from some of the apostles. And don't think that that means that they weren't as important. They are absolutely as important because one of the things that made those apostles apostles is they got to personally spend time with Jesus. And so we can always, when we read, whether it be from Peter or James or any of those uh, apostles, even Paul, because Paul had that moment on the Damascus Road, we can trust it just like the words of Jesus. And so in all of what we saw, the New Testament teaches us more about what the Old Testament sets up. And the New Testament completes what the Old Testament points to. Of course, we're talking about, most of all, Jesus that the Old Testament points towards the existence and the promise of a Savior to come and the need for a Savior to come. In the New Testament, we see Him come at the beginning of what we know of as the New Testament in the four Gospels, and then we see what it's like shortly after that as the church gets started based on their faith in Jesus Christ. Today, in, this, in these two weeks that we look at the greatest two, we literally come to a time in the Gospels where Jesus is asked specifically about the commandments. He doesn't just in his own will teach about them, but he is asked specifically which one is the greatest. We're going to take a look at what he tells us is the greatest. Now for us, if uh, you know, hopefully we don't have any come up and for those of us with multiple children and say, hey, who's your greatest child? We hope that at least they're both or three of them or four of them, however we got, aren't all around at the time when they get asked that, right? That way we don't have to, you know, Hedge our bet. No, I'm just kidding. Some of y'all are looking at me like, you've got a favorite? No, Sherry does. It's okay. Uh, but, <laughs> no. But, but again, that's kind of the same idea though here. How could I pick between my two wonderful and amazing daughters? I don't have a favorite between. They're both my favorite. They are. I don't know how you do it at your house, but that's how it is at my house. <laughs> so, Presley's the favorite. I know, I know. It's the girl. That's right. So you wait when you have two girls, that's the way it goes. But when he's asked, what's the greatest commandment, they're trying to trick him, right? They're trying to make him pick one and alienate the others. And that's what that question does when somebody asks us, oh, well, who's your greatest child? Which nobody asks that. Please don't ever ask anybody that. Bad idea, right? That's not going to help anything. But if you were asked that question, it'd be hard to choose. It'd be impossible to choose. Because they all, I mean, when we think of our families, we think of them as a unit. Not just as one person or another person or this or that. Same thing is true about the commandments. And when Jesus gives his answer, he answers in such a way that it's perfect. Just as all of Jesus' answers are perfect, just as he never gets tripped up, even though men continued to try to trip him up, he never got confused, he never hesitated, he always knew not only how to answer, but he knew what they were going to ask even before they asked it. And so he answers perfectly. And I think that in this, after we've begun to, to grow in our understanding even a little bit more over these last ten weeks of the Ten Commandments, it all comes to the greatest two. Isn't God wonderful in the fact that He does this for us? He takes all of His character, everything that God and God alone is. It's beyond our comprehension. We can't even begin to understand all that God is because He is unlimited in his being and in his power and in his knowledge and as we'll see today in his love. But we're so very limited in so many ways. In so many of those attributes and more. We only see just a very small fraction, just a sliver of what is. 
And God is all of what is. We're limited in that. But this is the amazing thing that God does for us. He gives us enough of Him at exactly the moment we need to have that amount of Him. He always, He takes all this hugeness of all of creation and more. And He speaks to you and me where we can understand it. He narrows it down. He simplifies it without it losing its power. He brings it down. That's what the greatest two are all about. In the greatest two, we find these things. We find these two commandments. And some people might say, well, really, it's just one commandment. We'll talk about that in just a minute. In Matthew chapter 22, start with verse 36, we read this. Somebody asks, as they say, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Did you catch it? There's two. They asked what's the greatest one, and Jesus went an extra mile, didn't he? Jesus gave it even a better answer than they they wanted. Of course, they wanted an answer in a totally different direction. Again, they wanted to trip him up. But he gave us two. We call these two together the greatest commandment. That's okay. That's the way we refer to them. That's all right. If you uh, you remember back in the 90s when uh, a lot of the idea of purpose-driven church or purpose-driven, you know, fill in the blank, there was a coffee mug for all of them, right? There was purpose-driven youth ministry and purpose-driven gardening and purpose-driven all kinds of stuff. Those five purposes that that we read about that I believe are accurate, they come from the Great Commission, where Jesus tells us to go and take the gospel and baptize and make disciples, and the greatest commandment, right? So it's okay to refer to them as one, but they are indeed two commandments. And we know that because Jesus said, the first is this, and the second one is like the first. That's referring to two commandments. Again, that may be a little bit of semantics there, but but it's important for us to understand that they build on one another. Here are the two commandments broke down as simply as we can do it in four total words. You ready? Love God, love others. And love God is what we're going to talk about today. Love God. This looks a lot like what we saw in the first few commandments out of the Ten Commandments, doesn't it? What was commandment number one? Don't worry, I don't have it on the screen for you, so you don't have to get nervous. I'll just tell you. It was that there's no other God. And then the next three commandments, at least through verse or commandment four, if not through commandment five as well, talk to us about that vertical relationship. We mentioned that as we went through them a few weeks ago. Love God. Love God. Now that seems so simple. It's two words for us, the first commandment. Love God. It's so simply put, so then why do we struggle with it? Some of us at that point would say, I don't struggle with it. If that's true for us, then we should be absolutely outstanding amongst the people around us in this world. If we love God the way He's talking about loving Him, the way He commands us to love Him, the way that the first of the greatest two, Jesus says to love Him, it makes a difference in our lives. It changes everything. And it actually makes way for the second commandment, second greatest commandment, to love others. We must love God. And here's what we find out today. We're going to turn to 1 John chapter 4 in just a minute. But what we find out today in loving God, how does this line up? We find out first off that God is love. He is love. So what is this here? Is this God saying to us, hey, I'm great, love me? Well, yes, but I believe there's more to it than than just that. God is saying, this is who I am. Be like me. Be with me. Come into this love. Not just come into this love in love for you, but come in and return this love to the one who gave it first. God is love. Now John, the Apostle John, talks about this at great detail. But in 1 John chapter 4, we get to the beginning of our passage for this morning. He says in 1 John 4, verse 7, he says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. 
Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God sh showed his love amongst us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And after just those first four verses or so, you might sit back and go, wait a minute, this sounds a lot more like love others, but we've got to understand this. I would contend to you today that our problem is not wanting to love God. Our problem is with our comprehension of what God says is the meaning of the word love. It's not that we come in here or that we walk out into this world and go, you know what, I want to love God less than he deserves to be loved. It's that we hear the word love and we think about it a certain way. And even worse than that, even more complicated than that, we think about love dependent upon who we're talking about loving or even what we're talking about loving. We're limited in our language, and therefore we're limited in our concept of all of this. We're limited because we say that word love to talk about our love for God, our love for our spouse, our love for our children, our love for our community, our love for our jobs and our livelihood, our love for our hobbies and our other passions, our love for our sports teams, our love for our music, our love for our you know, pizza or ice cream. We use the same word all the way. No wonder we get confused. It's not all the same love. And so when God says that we should love him, and we see that he is love, and then he explains to us in this passage that we're working through this morning, as he explains to us where this love comes from and what this love is like, hopefully, I believe that John's purpose and the Spirit's purpose through John, and, and the Spirit wanting us to hear it today, is making sure that we understand that we don't love God like we love fishing. We don't love God like we love sports. We don't love God even like we love our children. We don't love God even like we love our spouse. That there is a higher level of love. Now here's the great thing about that. When we understand the love that God has for us and that he calls for us to have for him, it changes the rest of the way we love everybody else and it changes the perspective we have when we say we love other things. It all starts with, and this is why this is the greatest of the greatest too, love God. Now Jesus came back there when he said that uh, in what we read in Matthew chapter 22. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. He's still also, by the way, quoting back to Deuteronomy, right? He's, he's, he's telling us, he's, he's taking the Old Testament, something that would have been familiar to the Jewish people in that time, and he's expounding upon it. He's adding to it. He's completing it. He's fulfilling it. And that's what he calls us to do. So when we say God is love, well, God is the love that only he is. So that kind of sounds weird, doesn't it? But here's the thing. God is the ultimate love. You say, well, wait a minute. I've been reading through the Old Testament. I've, I've studied the Old Testament. And God does some things to people that don't seem real loving. How is one who is love, how does he tell you know, his people to wipe out nations? Go to the New Testament. We, we talked about Ananias and Sapphira not too long ago. How does he confront them with their sin to the point that it actually causes them to drop dead? How in the world is that loving? Here again, it's our incomplete understanding of love. Because to us, and, and, and this is what gets us confused when we talk about loving God and the fact that God is love, is we think that love is always blowing smoke for other people, right? Always telling them things they want to hear. And we feel love when people tell us the things we want to hear. When we get settled into that in our lives, though, in those rare instances that people actually tell us the truth in love for our betterment, not for our condemnation, not so they can seem like they're on a high horse, but so that we can get better in our faith, better in whoever we are, it hits us differently. It seems strange. We don't even really know how to, you know, it, how to work with it. It makes an impact. Or it should. God is love, and that love is something that is bigger than what we think it is. And therefore, when He tells us to love Him, it's bigger than what we think it is. 
or at least bigger than what we've been convinced that we, that we believe it to be. It's bigger. It's more. It's deeper. It's stronger. It's purer than what we oftentimes think about. We can't flippantly say that we love God. Yet some of us, we get, we get tempted. We fall into that temptation to do that very thing all the time. Oh, I love God, and it's usually followed by what? But. I love God, but I can't do this for Him. I can't serve in that way. I can't forgive this person. I can't be a part of this ministry. I can't be a part of this relationship, whatever. I love God, but. Here's the thing. God is love, and there's not a but involved. His love is perfect. And that's what He calls us to give back to Him. In verse 7 we just read, John said it this way. He said, dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Now it doesn't make any sense for God to be love, to give us his love, and then to tell us to love in a different way, does it? It's good that that doesn't make sense because that's not at all what he does. He gives us his love to teach us his love, and then he calls us to love like he loves starting with him and then loving others as well. He says, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Some deep thinkers might hear ask the question, well, wait a minute. Is it possible for someone who's not a Christian to love? Some theologians would say, no, it's not. I don't know if I agree with that. I don't know, you you think about it and, and pray about your own conclusion on this idea. But I don't know that I believe that we come into this life sinful. I do believe that part of it, but that we're incapable of any love at all. Because I know people who are lost. I know myself in the 12 years I lived before I was saved, in that time I was lost. I know that there was love there. I loved my mom. In fact, what my mom's example was for me was a big part of how God communicated the gospel to me so that I would be saved at 12 years old. I know, I know that I loved her, but there was more to it. There was more to come. I loved her with every ounce of my ability at that time, but when someone puts their faith in Jesus, their concept of love grows. He enables us at a higher level, in a deeper way to love. Sometimes people outside of the church, people who are not believers, hear us talk about, well, real love, and they get offended In fact, some of us might even read that scripture and think that ourselves today. So you're saying, I can't love if I'm not one of these Christians? No, I don't think that's the case at all. But there's no love like God's love. And until we understand God's love, respond to God's love, and begin to have Him let His love flow through us, yeah, we've loved before, but in a different sense of the word. We've, We've been in love maybe, but in a different sense of the word. God's love is different. He says everyone who loves has been born of God because, and he's talking about the love of God. We can't do it on our own. We can't concoct it. We can't manipulate it. We can't invent it because it only comes from God. In chapter 4, verse 8, he says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. He spells it out for us. Whoever doesn't love the way God loves doesn't know God. Because when we come to know God, for you and I, we understand that it's putting our faith in Jesus Christ, giving our life over to Him. That's when we come to know God. And in that, He saves us. He he indwells with us in the Holy Spirit at that point. And now we have love in us that He desires to flow out. Because that's who He is. That's what He's all about. In verse 9, he said, this is how God showed his love among us. And he's about to explain the type of love that is God's love. It says this, he says, he sent his one and only son. Now, other translations would put one and only begotten son. And this is the reason they put that word in there is because that's different than a created son. Men, we can all be sons of God, but only one of us, Jesus, was begotten of God. The rest of us were created. He says he gave, he sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This God that is love, 
What is that love like? It is absolutely sacrificial. Hopefully none of us believe with our hearts or with our minds or with our actions that we were worthy of God sending His own Son. Because sending Him to this earth meant He sent Him also to die on the cross for us. And i got to tell you, your preacher wasn't worth that. Not on my own. Only God chose to do that. I couldn't make Him. I couldn't earn it. I'd have never got there. Neither would you. But God loved in such a way that He is sacrificial in that love. And therefore, when He tells us to love Him, He calls us to love Him the way He's loved us to be sacrificial in the way we love God. Now, Baptist preacher world, this is a great time to talk about giving. That's not the point today. It's part of it. But it's not just about being sacrificial in our love for God in what we give financially, but what we give emotionally. What we give in presence. What we give in godly and spirit-led activity. What we give in service what we give in the renewing of our minds and being able to get off of the way we used to think about things before we were focused on God and alive in Christ and start to see His purposes for all the things that we do in our own personal life and certainly in our life together as a church. God's love is sacrificial. So when He calls us to love Him, it must also be sacrificial. You say, wait, are you saying that God would have us to sacrifice our children? Not physically. But He absolutely would have us to put our our God above our children. And that's hard sometimes. Guys, that's tough. But it's true. Because as as wonderful as our children are, we don't have them without a God who loves us. He made them. Some of us know all too well how hard it is to try to do that on your own. And we realize that only God can bring a child into this world. And he can only do it in his timing. God puts that value there and he calls us to love him even more than we love them. And we could give a lot more examples today, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to leave it there. No matter who else we love, God calls us to first love him. He says this is love, not that we love God, but that he sent his son, uh, he sent, he, that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Why did he send him? Just to have us be, be able to be with him? No, because there had to be a sacrifice and God's love is such. It's sacrificial in such a way that we would have his son, the only one that could atone for our sins, he would willingly give him that we might be saved. See, we find out also here that God loves first. God doesn't sit back and wait for us to love him and then decide to love us in return. It works in exact the opposite direction. God shows us his love first. Now, some of us would say at this point, man, I don't know. I'm having a tough life. I've dealt with a lot of things. I don't know if God's really loving me this way. Do not judge God's love on your earthly circumstances. Because guess what? Whether you believe in God or not, your earthly circumstances are what they are. There's a ton of people who say there is no God who are going through some of the same circumstances and worse than we are. Don't judge a holy God and how you should love Him based on your earthly circumstances. That's exactly what our enemy would have us to do. And that's exactly what's pulled so many people away from being obedient to this first of the greatest two commandments of loving God. God loves first. Well, how can I know that? Well, here's this. Here's one test. Take a breath. Breathe it out. You didn't make that happen. You drew it in, maybe. You might have consciously made the decision to do that, but even when you're not concentrating on breathing, guess what? You're breathing. God made that. He made all the air to come in, and even though some air is better than others, He has given us the exact mixture of air that we need so that when we breathe in and breathe out, it works. That's love. God loves us even in that way to provide that for us. God loves first. We go on in chapter 4 of 1 John and verse 11, and he says this, he says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, 
and His love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in Him and He in us. He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will not, excuse me, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment, and the one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. God loves first. We'll get to what that means for us here in just a second. But John here spells out more of what it means to be loved by God and therefore explains a little bit more to us about what it means when God calls us to love Him back. He says, since God loved us, we ought to also love one another. Love begets love. Love breeds love. Love supplies more love. That's the nature of God's love. God's love is not only sacrificial, but it's also contagious. It's also, it also is multipli- mul- I can't say the word. <laughs> it's multiple. It, it, it multiplies itself. It grows. He says here that, that we, we ought to also love one another. That's how strong God's love is. That when he shows us his love, when we realize his love, when we love him back as he calls us to, that's going to grow in all of our lives. I don't know, and I've never heard of anybody, and I don't really believe there could be someone who could say, I love God the way that God is calling us to love Him the way that He deserves to be loved without that love spilling out into other places in their life. Which is why, a little jump ahead to the second of the greatest two commandments, that's why he, Jesus tells us, love God and love others. It's not two conscious choices. It's when we do one, the other one will come from it. And there'll be similar love with God at the head. God loves first, and then he grows it in us. Verse 12, he told us, no one's ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. God's love is made manifest in us. And what that means is, is that when we love God the way we're supposed to, and and, and as we grow in that, and it shows, other people see, not us, but him. Other people get to the point where God's love is revealed to them. You see this cycle that God has set up that is glorious. We could spend our whole lives trying on our own to love people the way God loves them. We'd never get there, and because we'd never get there, what people would see in us would be a diminished image of God. But when we love Him because He's loved us, and that love spills out into the rest of our lives, they see Him as He is and as He's deserving to be seen. Verse 13, he told us, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He's given us his spirit. It would have been enough just to send Jesus to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. But even more than that, he doesn't say, okay, believe in Jesus, now do the best you can, even though a lot of us, that's the way we tend to treat it. Instead, he gives us the Holy Spirit. His love is not only sacrificial, it doesn't only multiply itself, But it's also a love that provides. It's a love that gives us what we need, everything we need, to do what He calls us to do. In verse 14, He says, And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. John could say this firsthand. He literally had seen with his own eyes. In 15, He went on and said, If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. Make sure you catch the connection here between loving God because He's loved us first and acknowledging Jesus as our Savior and Lord. You can't separate those two things. If you're here today and you've not put your faith in Jesus, no matter how much you might talk about it, you don't love God the way He deserves to be loved because you haven't listened to what He says and done what He says. That's part of loving Him, is to obey Him. Jesus said that multiple times. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, right? You'll do as I've called you and instructed you to do. 
verse 16, he says, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. Boy, that's a big challenge. It's a big statement. Because a lot of us get up and we get about our days relying on us and the people around us. And then when we get in a bad spot, that's when we start to rely on God. But that's not what he says here. Loving God is to rely on Him in our knowledge of Him. He reminds us again, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. He says, this is how love is made complete in verse 17. Among us so that we, it's made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. And then he goes on to tell us that there's no fear in love. We don't have to be afraid of what God might do to us if we receive His love and return His love, putting our faith in Jesus being saved and not having to fear judgment. Knowing judgment will come for all of us, but also knowing that we've put our whole heart in Jesus. And when we've done that, we don't have to be afraid because in verse 18 he tells us perfect love, God's love, when we experience it and we return it to Him, when we love God, that drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Does this mean if we've ever been afraid, we're not loving God right? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a fear of judgment, a fear of God that maybe God won't accept him. Folks, you can know that today. And God loves you enough to help you to know that today. But the only way you can know what's going to happen for you at judgment is if today or sometime before today, you have laid down your life and given it all to Jesus. If you've believed in Him, enough not just to say, oh, I believe He exists, but to say He exists and He loves me to, enough to change my life and for me to build my life around Him. Not around my thoughts, not around my traditions, not around my opinions, but around His Word. He said in verse 19, we love because He first loved us. Love is a response. It's a response for us. When it comes to loving God, it's a response. God has shown His love. He's given us this life and He wants to give us eternal life above and beyond that. He does that in love. For us to love God the first of the greatest two, and therefore, as Jesus has put it, the greatest of all the commandments. We have to respond appropriately. What's your response today? God has loved you, and look, I don't know how long I've been up here today, but I could be up here for a lifetime and not be able to fully describe to you, fully teach you, fully preach on the, on the totality of what God's love is. But the great thing is, it's not just about what I can explain to you. You felt God's love in your life. You've benefited from God's love already, even if you've not put your faith in Jesus. And scripture tells us that there's more. There's more to us loving God back. Would you find that more today? Would you lay down your life? Would you get over yourself? Would you, would you say, it's not about me and mine, it's about Him? Would you put your faith in Jesus today? In just a second in our invitation, we're going to ask you if you'd like to do that. You respond however God's leading you. There's no pressure from us, but there's nothing more glorious than someone, whether they're young, whether they're old, whether they've never been in church before, or whether they've lived their whole life in church. There's nothing more joyous, there's nothing more wonderful than the person coming to know I've not given him my whole life. And so today, if that's you, don't sit still during the invitation. If you know you need to give Him your life, if you've been fighting it, if you've been holding back, you've been distracted, you've been thinking of other things instead of that, and He keeps bringing it back to you, don't let today go by. He can save you today. Would your response to God be submission to Him because he, Jesus has submitted His life for you? For those of us that are in the room that we know we've put our faith in Christ, and I know you hear me say this every week, right? Oh, it's invitation time. We start to gather up our things, check and see what time it is. Wonder if the, you know, the roast is done or whatever. We get such to be creature of habits. But listen, Christian, do you love God? Do you love God? Not in a way that satisfies me or satisfies you or satisfies somebody else, but do we love God in a way that satisfies God? If we are literally talking about what Jesus teaches us from his words and in his word, that is the greatest commandment, how are we doing on that one? 
Boy, we'll spend a lot of time talking about this theological issue and this idea and this person's behavior and what should be going on and our politicians and our, you know, all of the people in our lives, our family. We'll spend a lot of time on this, but Christian, I'm asking you today, do you love God the way that God calls you to? If you do, keep doing it because it's contagious and the rest of us need to see it because we need to see God in you. But if you don't, don't be beat up today. Realize that just in the sense of realizing, hey, I'm not loving him the way I need to, brings us to the greatest providence in our life at that point. He says, but you can start to today. You can get back to it if you've walked away from it. Christian, do you love God? And if so, how do you know? What does your life look like that's different from people who are not loving God properly that lets you know that you love him? And there, once you see that, how does it line up with what's said here? Not with just what's done in Baptist churches, not in just what's been done in this church or in your life or in your family, but with this word, because this is what we're judged by. The embodiment of this law, this word, Jesus Christ. Do you love God? If not, today, Christian, would you do what you've been saved to do? Give your love to God. He deserves it. He is absolutely worthy of it. And he'll use it to change you in so many ways that you could never change yourself. If you've not put your faith in Jesus, would you come? If you have and you realize you're falling down on loving him, would you come? And You don't have to talk to me. I'd love to talk to you. I'm here for you. But you can come straight and come to the altar and let's just pray to God. Say, God, help me to love you. Help me to love you the right way. Help me to love you as you've commanded me. Whatever other prayer requests you have, whatever other needs you have, whatever else God is doing in your heart, don't waste time. Don't miss an opportunity. As we sing in just a moment, would you come? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, today that you love us. God, we didn't produce that. We can't make it happen. You choose to love us. And Father, that is one of life's biggest mysteries as to why. But we praise you because you do. Father, help us to not only feel your love, to experience your love, but to love you back. Lord God, to obey that first and greatest of the commandments, to love you the way you deserve to be loved. Lord God, for the one who's not put their faith in Jesus today, would you bring them to salvation even now? Father, would you help them to make it public here? If they've prayed it on their own, or they do in the next few moments, or they come down and we pray together, Father, help us to make that public that we can see one more person giving their life to love you the way you've loved us. Father, let us be encouraged by that. Lord, for the Christians in the room who struggle with loving other things, other people, other ideas, other pursuits that aren't loving you the way we need to, Father, in your conviction, would you draw us to come back to loving you and grow us in how we love you and in our motivation to do so. Father, whatever you do in this time, this is our response, our worship, because of what you've done for us being here in all the experiences you've given us today. Help us to respond to you in truth, Father, in vulnerability, Lord, in reality. Be glorified, Lord, as we glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand. family. Yeah, if you looked at a picture of ours, we'd certainly look different. We have two biological children. We have three adopted children. So certainly if you look at a photo, you see brown hair, you see dark skin, you see blonde hair. And certainly we do get weird looks, but the great thing is seeing the Lord work and do things that you never 
even dreamed possible. The call to adopt came out of intimacy with the Lord, just like our calling to plant this church. I'm the church planting pastor of Refuge Church in the Ortega community of Jacksonville. We've been here about two and a half years. It was a community that was very unreached, and being there, the Lord just began to kind of do something in our heart. We didn't set out to plant a church for foster and adoptive families. It really just happened. The Lord did it. A lot of our church has become people from this community who are fostering or who are adopted. So we share that in common. People are longing for community. And when you add the layer of taking on people and children from difficult places, it's not easy. It's not comfortable. I think the reason they've shown up here, there's a big closet full of diapers and shoes and strollers and car seats. And they see that and they come here to get a need met. Through that, they build a relationship. Next thing we know, they're in our church on a Sunday. And I think about the amount of children who come to our church who, if families didn't say yes to foster care and adoption, uh, those, those children would never hear about Jesus. They'd never hear the gospel. This is the calling that God has for us. And when people give to Annie Armstrong, you're able to support those who are on the front lines of gospel work and people hear the gospel who would never have a chance to hear the gospel. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, this chance to come out and get together with fellow Christians and worship you and learn about your love for us, Lord, and, and about the things we can do to, to better love you, Lord, and to show you our love. And dear Lord, I, I also thank you so much for these young men on either side of me here for being willing to come up and help in, in a service to you, Lord, and to our church, Lord, and we just hope that, that through this we, we grow young men who, who move on into their adult life that, that stay in church and, and serve the church, Lord, and it's just such a blessing to be standing here with them. Dear Lord, we also just ask that you take the offering that we collect today and, dear Lord, just, just use it to your will and to the blessing of, of your church and your people, Lord. We ask all these many things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
our ministry spotlight, we've got two things to tell you. You saw the video just a moment ago about Annie Armstrong, or at least the emphasis for that particular missionary family. Uh, there are missionary families of all types, all sorts, all ages, and in all places throughout North America that are supported by what we give in our church regularly, but especially by what we give when we do our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. So would you continue to pray about what God would call you to and lead you to give in and towards supporting North American missions here all over our continent? So very thankful that we got to see some of the same Spirit of God working yesterday in our fourth annual Harrisville Extravaganza. For the first time, we had multiple churches involved, as well as the Harrisville Economic Council, plus the Volunteer Fire Department, uh, and so many more. Uh, we, we were so excited. I'm, we're going to show you a little video that Allie put together for us as she went around and did a great job not only dealing with social media, but also getting all kinds of pictures and all that stuff. We appreciate all she's doing for us. Take a look at this video. We'll tell you one more thing before we dismiss. Okay, okay. I'm about to have a good day. No matter what they say. Sun is shining down on me. Birds are singing praise. I'm about to have a good day. In every single way. The God who made the universe knows me by my name, so it's a good day. Maybe in my arms, walking through the neighborhood. Living in the present, not what it should have occurred. Low is a rug. Now I'm standing up. Look at what my father does. Turning old things new. Gray skies blue. Hear the church say, yeah, won't he do it? I know he's got my back. That's why I'm singing that. I'm about to have a good day. No matter what they say. Sun is shining down on me. Birds are singing praise. I'm about to have a good day. In every single way. We praise God that he not only took care of the weather, but he brought a great crowd, one of the better crowds we've had in the four years of doing the extravaganza yesterday. Uh, it's such a great opportunity, and we're looking forward to a year from now as he leads, uh, even growing it with the other churches involved and all the things that could come from that. So don't, it's not too early to start praying about what it could look like next year. And as well, it's also not too early about what your part could be in it next year. Uh, we had a lot of folks who came out, uh, as, as we numbered it, probably close to about 50 from our church, give or take a few, uh, that worked either in the very beginning of planning or supplying gifts and, and prizes or eggs. Uh, might even have more than 50 when we actually include all the people who put eggs together. Uh, and then also who came out and served at the event. So we just want to tell all of you who helped in every way, and especially those of you who prayed diligently for the extravaganza this year, we thank you. We praise God for you, and we really appreciate it. Uh, the one thing I heard throughout the day yesterday was it was simpler than it had been. It's because we had great volunteers serving in the way they were doing it. It was less stressful than it had been in years past, and that's a good thing. But guys, look, we still got a lot more community to reach, and just one event doesn't reach them. It gives us a step, a foot in the door to reach. That's just part of the process. So let's continue to grow in how we serve, continue to grow in why we serve, not just to serve the people of Harrisville Baptist Church, but to serve the people outside these doors in the community that God has put us in. And let's be a lighthouse, along with our sister churches, standing for Christ and sharing the gospel as we go. Thank you for being a part of that in every way that you are. We hope you have a great afternoon. Looks like the rain's kind of slacked up a little bit, maybe, so you can get to your car. So God bless you. Have a great afternoon. We hope to see you back this afternoon. See you. All right, Bill, will please stand? Thank you.